So we're just heading into the main part of Abydos now. I'm not going to go into the Assyrian just yet. We're going to have a look around the temple first. This is the main causeway. And I must remember this was like a funerary temple. This whole area around Abydos was like a massive graveyard, tombs everywhere. And it even goes back to pre-dynastic times before the first pharaoh, as well as Hierankopolis is nearby with the, the giant king, who was the first king of the second dynasty. That's kind of around this area. So it's, it's an absolutely amazing place. We're gonna have a look at all different aspects of it, see what we can find today. We've got Yusef here, we've got Andrew Collins and JJ Ainsworth and myself. We're gonna be investigating it. Uh, we're just about to enter the main temple complex of Seti the uh, First, but outside we find some treasures already. Uh, there's a couple of pillars here, one of which is recycled from a much larger block that's probably rectilinear in appearance that was clearly covered in hieroglyphs, certainly on one side of it. Uh, and they've reconstituted this stone to create a circular pillar. Uh, but what's so interesting is that the area that they've kept relates very specifically to the god Thoth. Uh, which they've kept. They could easily have just destroyed that or blanked it out or whatever, but no, it was obvious that the god Thoth, who was the god of the moon, the god of writing, um, was considered to be important here enough for that pillar to remain as it was. Now, whether it was covered up or not, I don't know, but um, certainly they felt it important enough for the image of Thoth to remain as it is in the centre of this base of the pillar. So Abydos dates back to at least 1500 to 1600 BC. It was built partly by Seti the first, but also Ramesses the second, who was his father. And the interesting thing about this site is what's behind it. So we have this main L-shaped Seti temple, which has sort of remarkable things, including the kind of what looks like alien or futuristic vehicles and tanks and flying machines. Also, we have the King's List, which we're going to look at. And also, most importantly, the Assyrian, which is behind here, this huge megalithic sunken temple, which may date from a much earlier era. So this is one of the most interesting places. It's about, what, 90 miles from Luxor, north of Luxor, it's 30 miles north of Dendera. And it has got this energy about this place. It's some, this is also the place where Dorothy Eady, or Omseti, who was born in 1904 and she was this English lady who banged her head when she was like four years old and basically died and came back to life and started having all these visions of her life here in Abydos and ancient Egypt. And the story goes that she kind of she remembers her past life and it's one of the most compelling stories regarding reincarnation that I've ever come across. Uh, I've read her book, I've researched her life, I got interviewed about her for um, an episode of uh, Ancient Aliens or The Unexplained and there's something quite remarkable about her story because it really does have a lot of truths in it. I mean one of the things that stands out is the whole idea that she actually had a kind of life here. She described the gardens that once existed on the south side of the temple. They weren't even discovered during her life, you know, until the very end of her life. But she clearly described them and eventually they found proof of them years later. And she was even involved in the excavation. And so she was a remarkable woman. She became this top Egyptologist, draftswoman. She worked with all the top archeologists. Also, she kept reminding everyone of her story of her past life, where she kind of fell in love with Seti. She was like a commoner girl of the local area. Her father disappeared, went into the military. Her mother was a vegetable seller, according to what she was, you know, her story. And so she was kind of remembering all these details of her past life. She ended up committing suicide because she fell in love with Seti. They were about to have an affair, but it would, it went against all the rules of 
her priestly training, which she was having at the time. And so, and then she, she died with such trauma, her past life, when she remembered it in more modern times, came to fruition. It made this incredible story. Now, she wasn't claiming to be anyone like Cleopatra or like, uh, you know, Nefertiti or anything like that. She was like a commoner girl of the local village who just happened to have this connection with Seti and this temple where she lived and worked and spent her young life many thousands of years ago. Just up behind me here is the famous kind of block with these hieroglyphs carved that look strangely like a tank, an aeroplane, a kind of flying vehicle, a helicopter, and other kind of instances of modern kind of transport technologies, even like futuristic ones that haven't even been invented yet. So what is going on here? Is this an actual kind of future memory? Was it some kind of vision of the builders or was it people coming back from the past? Or is it just what archeologists and anthropologists say that it's actually just hieroglyphs carved over other hieroglyphs, which coincidentally create all these very strange vehicle looking things on one particular stone. So the jury's out on this, but the ancient astronaut theorists and the alternative thinkers believe it could be some indication of something quite remarkable going on and recorded here at Abydos. This is the very famous um, king list to be found in the temple of Seti I at Abydos. Uh, and you can see here the king himself uh, gesturing towards the different cartouches that represent each of the different kings from the very first one who uh, ruled at the beginning of the, the, um, the first dynasty, Nama, um, who's more generally known as Menes in Greek, all the way through to his own father. Um, and you know, for him, this was almost like a record of time, and I think this is what this figure in front of him actually symbolises, because he's got these two scrolls in his hands, and presumably these are probably papyrus uh, scrolls that are actually recording this information down. Um, but on the other wall, we've actually got even more of these hieroglyphs, so it isn't just simply uh, on one, but it's everywhere. Uh, and what's interesting is that we have on the ceiling more cartouches, but they are interspersed with stars, the classic five-pointed star that's found in ancient Egypt. And, I mean, this is quite remarkable, you know. So why are the cartouches amongst the stars? And to me, what this suggests is that there's a reverence and acknowledgement towards the fact that in death the soul goes to the stars and actually becomes at one with the stars. Okay, on the wall behind me we have the king list of Seti I uh, in his temple that goes from Menes, the first king, right the way through and tell his own father. But on the opposite wall, the, uh, the, the different panels contain the names of the gods or the demigods uh, who presumably either ruled before him um, or were seen to be divinities associated with the sky world. Um, yeah, here's obviously uh, Seti the first himself there. He's making offerings of incense and um, mm -hmm. behind him is, is, is Horus, the god Horus uh, and, and obviously Seti is actually making offerings to Horus here uh, and this god here is uh, Amun. Amun Ra. Is it? Amun? Amun Ra? Yeah. It's the god Am Amun Ra. Just looking at a stone in the, uh, the avenue, the hallway that has the king's list but we just spotted this stone and it's got the bird on it, the Horus bird, and it's got what looks like a tank, <laughs> much like we saw on the panel above. 
place. Obviously, we got the tank, which I'm sure we can find a much more mundane interpretation for. Um, but below it, we've actually got the sign for Nitta, which is uh, God, uh, and obviously various other hieroglyphs, which uh, uh, obviously relate to a much bigger message here. But it does look like the same type of hieroglyph that gives us, gives us the tank inside the main building itself. So that's quite amusing. Plus on the top of this block, we have keystone cuts, which would obviously have joined together the various different blocks. I mean, there's, there's another one here. So these are like these bow tie, like, um, uh, you know, joins that, that would be used to bind together lintels in particular. Uh, we found them uh, at Hawara, for instance, which was uh, 12th dynasty. But of course, they can be found all over the world. You know, we've seen them in Peru, we've seen them in Cambodia, uh, and I know that they're, in, that they're in various other countries as well. Um, was this independent development, uh, in, or independent invention, or was there some kind of contact between the different cultures involved in the use of these keystone cuts? We've pointed out some very interesting features which you may not have seen before um, and please subscribe please like please leave a comment let us know what you think of this site and we'll see you next time megalithomaniacs